Hey, everybody, welcome back to a new episode uh, with me, Jen Niza, here on X Psychic Saved. This is going to be a really uh, interesting video. I know I say that about all the videos, but I do find it rather interesting. Tattoos. So I'm sure by now a lot of you have noticed that I have tattoos, and a few people have asked me about them and commented on them. So I couldn't think of a better guest to join me today in this episode to talk about tattoos. I always think these things are a great uh, conversation starter and one that we should have amongst us in the church and for the world to see so that they, they don't think we're running around being hypocrites. Anyway, Pastor Chris Quintana, who joined me on another video that we did about The Chosen, which I can link if you have any interest in checking that out, agreed to have this conversation with me because Pastor Chris himself has gotten some pushback. No, not about tattoos, but about long hair. Stay tuned for this episode as we delve into, is it okay to have tattoos and for men to have long hair? Stay tuned. <music> Welcome, Pastor Chris Quintana. Thank you so much for uh, doing this video with me, our second video together. It's, um, you know, we, we face a lot of uh, battles in this world, topics in the world that the Bible's not silent on. And we need to have the conversation, how to look at these topics as Christians, especially because, you know, the world is watching and we don't seek to be hypocrites. We seek to obey God. And so I welcome the comments that people have left me wondering about tattoos and the fact that I have them. And so I think that, again, it's a great uh, door open to have this conversation. And of course, we're going to go into your beautiful hair, <laughs> your flowing hair in the wind. But the most. <laughs> so once again, though, uh, Chris, where can people find you? Um, ministry is uh, Old Path Theology uh, with my name. And really, my the ministry itself is almost almost entirely dedicated to just teaching through the Bible. Uh, we take people to Israel. We do that. I speak at conferences. But the mainstay of what I do is uh, either a newsletter, trying to keep people up to speed on current events and how they have a biblical relevance. The rest of it is through the Bible study, Old and New Testament alike. So twice a week, we're studying Old and New Testament and working our way through the entirety of the Bible, every chapter, every verse. That's great. Thank you so much, guys. Definitely go check out Pastor Chris Quintana. So I think a great way to jump into this would be to let's start, Pastor, with how to even read the Bible, how to how to how to look at the text that we're seeing, because, of course, I know you're going to go a chapter earlier. Leviticus 19, 28 is the verse that people will uh site when it comes to tattoos. But how should we be looking at the scripture? Are we supposed to just take this verse out? Are we supposed to say, well, hey, it says it right there. So that's it. How dare you have a tattoo? Right. Can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah. Well, and this holds true. With, I don't care what book it is that we're, we're studying through. Mm -hmm. It's important that we uh, ask a number of questions like what we did. We were taught this in high school, most of which I slept through. But as far as high school was concerned, in English class in particular, um, we're supposed to diagram sentences. We're supposed to ask the who, what, where, when, why, and how. And that, that informs what, what it is that we're reading because it makes us extract the information that we're looking for rather than reading into a text. So. We call this, again, the fancy word is the inductive uh, way of studying the Bible. We don't want to go and say, I've got my mind made up about something. Let me go find something that agrees with me in the Bible. Or reading just a simple one verse, maybe two verses, and excluding everything else that's there. So you've mentioned the book of Leviticus. The who, what, where, when, why, how is where we start to observe things about it. The book of Leviticus. When was it written and for what reason? Well, it's post Exodus. It's when they're on their way to the land and God sets in place something that had never existed before, that being a priesthood. And then he was going to codify the law. So this is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. It was also kind of a precursor to them going into the land that was filled with pagans. And the paganism was something that once they got to the land, 
by reading into Numbers and Deuteronomy and other places there too, what's going to happen when you get to the land? Because you're going to you're going to notice cultural things, and there's quite a bit that goes on in that. So this particular part, as far as Le Leviticus is concerned, is when they're starting to be given a whole group of parameters of things that would be acceptable and things that would not be acceptable. So by chapter 18, it really kind of uh, begins to set this particular part of the book in, in its proper context and its understanding. So let me get the, the big thing out of the way here. It's important that we understand context, and I can understand people. I know that there are probably ones watching us right now. They're rolling their eyes back in their head saying, oh, here come all the excuses. Well, it's you can go ahead and ex uh, try, try to call them excuses all you want to. I want to be faithful to the text. That's all that matters to me. So what we look at in chapter 18 is starting at verse 3, it says, According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwell, you will not do, and then there's a, a semicolon, and according to the uh, doings of the land of Canaan where I am bringing you, you shall not do, nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You will observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. Context, context, context. Everything matters about what is being said here. So his point is, you're leaving a pagan country, a nation, Egypt, and I'm bringing you to Cana, same exact things. You're not going to do what they do. You're going to do what I say. And that is, again, who's the audience? The audience is the children of Israel, the sons of Jacob, the ones that were in that servitude for 400 years, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, his sons, and the generations that followed are coming back to the land promised to them by Ab or to Abraham by God hundreds of years prior. They are for the very first time going into this place, and they don't know what awaits them. So here God puts up very narrowly defined things that they're supposed to do. So I, I encourage everybody to go and read starting at chapter 18. Chapter 18 is dealing with prohibitions mainly of a sexual or, uh, orientation. So things like homosexuality, bestiality, I mean, some really off the wall stuff that shouldn't need to be addressed, but because they would encounter it where they went, God is saying, clearly, I'm going to plant my flag. You're not going to do these things. By chapter 19, there's a little bit of a change. So when we get to chapter 19, it starts a whole different thing, and it's about holiness. So when we get to chapter 19, verse 2, speak to the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It's a call to separation. And the same holds true when we get to what it says in 1 Corinthians about hair. It is about the, the culture of the time and how they are supposed to be separate and distinctly, verifiably, dis, you know, a distant from the rest of, of the culture. So chapter 19, when you start to look through it, they're told idolatry is against, that's, that's the beginning of, of this context, verse 4, do not turn to idols, nor make yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. So when you get to the nations, just like it was in Egypt, so it will be in Canaan, you're not to participate in the idolatry of the, of the Canaanites any less than you were when we were in Egypt. And so you go through it, if people want to take the time to look through it, verses 5 to 8 deals with what's a proper offering, because there were the pagan offerings, and they were supposed to be distinctly different. Once again, this is that is those guys. Here is what you are to do. So as you uh, move on through it, verses 9, 9 through 14, these are uh, provisions for the poor. What are you going to do about the poor that are among you? You don't exploit them. You take care of their needs. You're one people, and be careful for one another. That's covered there. I'll also mention that all of the other things that we're talking about here are re-emphasized when you get into Numbers and Deuteronomy. It's repeated. This stuff gets talked about over and over and over again. It was this way in Exodus. They were talked about exploiting the poor and things like this. So this is not one-off stuff that he's talking about here. Mm -hmm. However, when we get to the tattoos and the rest of that stuff, it is going to give some inside information or very, very tall grass kind of stuff that really isn't dealt with anywhere else. So as we read on a little bit further, when it gets to verses 15 through 37, this is really actions of what would be considered as right and acceptable to God as opposed to unacceptable as far as cultural stuff is concerned. 15 and 16 
is fair and just interactions. Don't defraud your, your brothers and sisters. And again, this is written to the children of Israel and how they are to conduct themselves among themselves. It's not about the culture. It's not about you must make them do this. It's about you do this among yourselves in the midst of a pagan culture. And that's kind of setting the table for where he goes. Verse 17 and 18 is anger and vengeance. You can't do that. That's not your domain. You're not supposed to do that. Verses 19 through 22, it's the mixing of kinds. You don't mix animals. You don't mix the seed that's in the land. You don't mix, you know, for plants and all that stuff. It, it's supposed to remain God, going all the way back to Genesis 1. God made things after their own kind, and they're not to mix those things. So this is all stuff, obviously, that's taking place in the culture, and they are to be distinctly different from that culture. Uh, verses 23 and 25 it's the idea of clean and unclean. And when it comes to fruit and, you know, if you're going to plant a fruit tree for the first three years, you don't eat it. It's considered unclean or uncircumcised. You cannot eat it until the fourth year. I mean, this is the stuff that we're talking about. So I would want to say basically to someone, okay, if you got to hang up about tattoos context wise, when you go buy fruit at the, uh, at the grocery store, are you making sure that it's from a four year old tree or onward? Cause if not, then you're going into idolatry. Right. This is the absurdity of it. So if we're going to be careful with the text, let's be careful with the text. And the same holds true for what we'll look at in Corinthians. Now we get to um, the, the, the consumption of blood is absolutely forbidden. And this is the, the context of what we are going to be looking at now. Um, look at verse 26, 27, and 28. You will not eat anything uh, with blood. So that means mm -hmm. anything that's been sacrificed that hasn't been drained of its blood properly, which was a big deal, mm -hmm. all the way back to Leviticus where it says you will not, the life is in the blood. I've given it as an atonement, chapter 10. You do not play fast and loose with this because this is foreshadowing Jesus. You don't play games with the blood. So anything that was eaten, the blood had to have been drained and offered to God. It wasn't that way with the pagans. Mm -hmm. So... You're, you're to be very careful. You will not eat anything with blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the context of this whole thing with the tattoos. Because, if again, if we're going to be careful, look at verse 25. That's about fruit. Change of subject in verse 26. Don't eat anything with blood, nor will you practice divination or soothsaying. Occultism. You're to avoid occultic practices. And if we look at all things that were forbidden occultic practices, there are so many others. There's only three verses dealing with a few things that he's mentioning here. Verse 27, you will not shave around the sides of your head, nor will you disfigure the edges of your beard. That's in the same context. So for the people that are all upset about tattoos, I want to ask them, well, are you growing a beard? Because you should, because you, you have to have one in order to defile it. Or are you one who shaves very closely around your hair? So people that have a problem with with um, uh, tattoos, I want to take a look at what kind of haircut you have because it's in the context. Are you being faithful to the text? So let's make sure that, you know, if you're going to go ahead and, and if this is a hill you want to die on, fine, let's go ahead and do it. Let's have a let's have a full, you know, workup on the particular text. And then I want to make sure that you're really keeping yourself to the rest of the law. Because the next right. part, and it's it's really, it's a very narrowly defined context, and it's about to become even more narrowly defined in verse 20, uh, 28. You will not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. Context in, in the midst of context. Broader, broader part, don't engage in occultic practices. That's shown outwardly, shaving of the sides of your head, or the changing of the way of you configuring your beard, which was something that Jews took very carefully, the five points, you know, the, the very carefully crafted beards, God is saying, I don't want you identifying with the culture because there's an occultic aspect to it. Not just, you know, it's just a culturally accepted thing. There was an occultic practice to it, and he really starts to get into the very fine points of it. Don't cut your flesh, leaving a mark on yourself for the sake of those who have died. And we know that that's an occultic practice of contacting the dead is, a, is still among us today. So I, before we go to the next part, I thought you might want to jump in on that coming from where you came from. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm thinking because so many people get tattoos 
uh, today for people that have died. However, I shouldn't say even for them. If you want to say in memory or whatever, for whatever reason, right? Not for whatever reason. They do it, but they by no means are looking to practice divination. They by no means think this tattoo is some sort of hotline to speak with that person, to practice necromancy, to do any of that. It's merely maybe just some sort of a memory or whatever they're doing it for, but they're not doing it for those reasons. So I think we need to be super clear on that. So again, if we're going to address people with those tattoos, we have to be super clear about that. Uh, what is the reason that you're do, are you doing it because you think that you can contact the dead? In which case, of course, we know that's a serious offense and we know that's very wrong because God is very clear about divination over and over and over again and the occultic practices not to do it over and over throughout his word. So I kind of like how you mentioned, you know, we don't see as many verses, which doesn't make those verses any less true, but how you're putting it into the context is so important. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to a question for you. A lot of people also have asked me if I believed that getting a tattoo is a blood covenant. And you're talking about the blood, we're talking about the animals with the blood, we're talking about the occult. I do not believe at all that there's some sort of an exchange because there's blood involved. Uh, in which case, in my opinion, if you believe that way, then you should never go to a phlebotomist. Blood will spill out and, and things like that, blood transfusions. So what do you think about that? Well, this is the ultimate fruit of reading into a text because it opens the door for you to read a whole lot more into it. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're already making it say something that it never said, and now you're adding to it. So once you open that door, this is the problem that when people take liberty with text, with the text of the Bible, where does it end? Because it, it'll lead to all kinds of awful conclusions. We see it every every bad doctrine that's ever introduced into the church is basically, it starts there. It's the misappropriating and taking out of context a particular passage and building some edifice upon which you can just add all kinds of other things. So the problem is it has a cascading effect. And I, you know, this is something I've fought against as a pastor for 20 years. And or more. And it is the things that people come to conclusions on. Again, the idea that God wants people to be prosperous. Well, where does that end? So right. if, if you're not, then it's a problem with you and it's you're not operating in faith. It's a whole different topic, but you get the picture. When you have an opinion about something and you're going to make the Bible agree with you, you can do all kinds of, of violence to it and you'll make it say things that it doesn't. And here's a prime example of that. Now, for the record, I don't have tattoos. There's no tattoos on my body anywhere. I've never, I've never had one. But if somebody comes to me as a pastor, is it wrong to have a tattoo? No, unless you're doing it for the reasons that we're talking about here. So uh, you mentioned the word necromancy, and I'm so thankful that you did. Because mm -hmm. if we didn't have anything, and necromancy is really what's ultimately being spoken of here. If this was the only place that it was found, we wouldn't have a lot to go on. But necromancy and sorcery and divination that is repeatedly over and over and over again expressly forbidden to the children of Israel. But this is the only place that you'll find talking about marking yourself in the way of a tattoo or a cut. And so, again, the context is, first of all, the biggest of the big context is idolatry. It is paganism. It is the occultism. The second part, as you pointed out, is for the dead. The necromancy, this would be part of the ritual and part of why you would cut yourself why you would, and really the two things are kind of hand in hand, you would cut yourself to leave an impression in your skin, whether you fill it with ink or not, is still going to do the same thing. Well, we see people with those those kind of uh, marks that they have in their, in their flesh where they cut it, and as it heals, it leaves a mark, even if you don't put ink in it. So this is along the same lines, and you can read on through the rest of it. The context goes on and on and on, but people, if they're going to really kind of die on this hill, like I said, Read the context and find out if you're doing all of these things, because if you're going to make yourself somehow subject to the law, to the children of Israel in a pagan culture coming into a land that they don't yet know, then you're going to have to live according to everything that's there. And of course, people don't do that because they pick and choose what they want to get bent out of shape over without ever paying attention to the immediate 
direct and then any broadened version of the context of what's being said here. And this is, again, such a great example of that problem. So this, we I might keep this off the record, but so what would you say, I'm going to ask the question, see how I described it. Would you, is that okay how I described it? Like, because I have, this is for my my children, my babies who I lost and they're in heaven. So I have one with that. And I have, I have one that says, mom, this is my, my daughter, Kara, who's here. She designed it. And I have Bible verses around, you know, with them and stuff, but that's not necromancy. Right. Yeah. It's not point of contact kind of we're using this and and there's a, there's an occultic connotation to it and some kind of implied um, ability or power or connection which you've already you know kind of covered a little bit so the reason why they did these things is different for the reason that people do them now and you know in, in, if, if people are going to try to say well can you not see at least some way that this could be considered as troublesome or whatever else okay if you're if you're doing stuff that that uh, and you're tattooing yourself up especially as a believer with occultic symbols or stuff like that or you have no care for what it looks like or you're doing it just to poke your finger in the eye of somebody, okay, then we can start to get into motivations as to why, but the the actual, the ink itself is pretty neutral. Mm -hmm. It's what's the intent behind it and why is it being done for what purpose? Those are always mm -hmm. the, in, the, the, the reasons why this is an important topic to look at. And again, it's one of the reasons why as a pastor, actually even before I was a pastor, it just wasn't something that interested me that much. And it's become much more of a cultural thing, probably in the last 20 to 25 years. And by that time, it just wasn't anything that really was of great importance to me. So mm -hmm. I never really spent a whole lot of time looking at it, you know, right. but it's not as though I'm some puritanical person. I mean, look at me, uh, you know, clearly it's, <laughs> not a, it's not some weird thing as far as I'm concerned. And I really did my due diligence. I've explained in a couple of responses to the comments. I did my due diligence before getting these tattoos. I spoke with my pastor at the time. I prayed, I read the text, of course, and I didn't just knee jerk act on anything. It wasn't impulsive. It took time and I have no interest in getting any more tattoos uh, at this point, but I would never want to make somebody else stumble. So kind of how I, I'm listening to you kind of, you know, when people get into Christian Liberty, so the stumbling block itself is not a tattoo. The stumbling block would be, do you have a Zodiac sign? Do you have the tarot card? Do you have, uh, you know, Satan on there? Do you have some numerology? Uh, right. Because as you said, the context is it was tying directly to the occult, right. directly to the occult. Because some people, of course, I would never want to make somebody stumble in the faith or be a hypocrite or anything like that. So it's so... Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, I would just want people to know that. And it's important to have these conversations with love and with grace and share the truth and to, uh, and to be very clear about this. So, uh, did you, what did you want to say about, did you want to say anything, comment on the blood covenant with, or demons coming out of the blood, uh, when you get tattoos? Yeah. And if that's something that, somebody believes in like i would say earlier you're reading way too much into the text because you're going even beyond what the text would say about a tattoo if you think that that is somehow something that's prohibited okay you can i think make this say something that it doesn't say but to take it that extra way that now you're opening demonic doors i mean you're really you're beyond stretching what's actually in the text now you're just making stuff up but it's not unusual, you know, because that, that happens all day, every day, especially when people hyper-spiritualize the text. And like, there's a, one of my favorite sayings, if you torture the text long enough, it'll say anything you want it to. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, moving out of tattoos, Pastor Chris, what have people been telling you about your gorgeous flowing hair? <laughs> well, let's turn there because that happens okay. to be in 1 Corinthians 11. And yes, I've had it put in my, <laughs> in, in, in my face a few times. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, of course, it never satisfies the person when I say it. But ultimately, I say it, it, it isn't as much that I'm trying to, you know, make a stand on something. It's more that I'm a little bit lazy. And uh, <laughs> I hate what my, my hair looks like when it's really short. 
and I don't like the shape of my ears. That those are a few different reasons <laughs> why I tend to grow it out a little bit. Okay. Um, it's been long as as kind of by choice since high school, and so mm -hmm. it's just it's kind of what I'm comfortable with, and uh, I really do look very horrible in a, in a little boy's haircut. So. <laughs> Um, if, I, if I was to shave the side of my head and do what most people do, it would probably send children screaming and running in the opposite direction. So I don't do it. <laughs> um, and of course, it's not because I want to try to look like a woman or else I wouldn't wear the mustache. So uh, and that's one of the things that I get asked, you know, of course. But this is another one of those situations. I just wish that people would read the entirety of the context of it. So observationally, mm -hmm. once again, who's he writing to? It's well, who's writing and who's he writing to? It's Paul. Who's he writing to? The church at Corinth. There's clearly something different happening at Corinth than the other places because Paul doesn't address any of this stuff in any of the other letters to any of the other churches. And again, it's like this is also more of a customary thing. It's not a thus says the Lord doctrinal thing that, you know, you're really in trouble if you if you infringe on this. It's clearly not that because that's how he ends the section that's there. But the beginning part of it, it's about covering. And that's the issue. Mm -hmm. So what's going on culturally? Some people have, have kind of speculated, does this have to do with the temple worship? We know that uh, the, the idea of hedonism in the temples was something that was very, very common. So this is a church that's mixing in with a pagan culture, and very much in that way, the same context that we had in Leviticus. What about God's people in the midst of people who do not believe as they believe? And how do you differentiate yourself from those people? So culturally, what's taking place there? Um, what, what we don't know or what we, we can't take from any of this text is what would be considered as long hair versus short hair. We get nothing about that. As far as the women and the head covering, is it a small head covering? Is it a large head covering? We don't know. We're not given those kind of specifics because it's not something that Paul is, is making a doctrinal issue. It's a cultural issue. We know that because of what he is saying here. Now, he applies a spiritual understanding to it. There is the matter of covering. The husbands were not wearing a covering because in the church, it's already assumed that Jesus is the head of the man as he is the head of the church and as God is the head of overall. He, he addresses that in the first opening verses of, of the context of the passage. And then as far as that's concerned in the church, there's no question who's, who's covering uh, man is. It's Jesus the head, he, and that's who's the covering. When it comes to the, the women in the congregation, some married, some unmarried, if they're in a married situation, of course they're covering their head. That's a way of showing that my husband is my head. And it's it's a funny thing about it. For women that might have a problem with this, uh, if of long hair, I would want to say, do you have a problem with the first part of it? Do you have a problem with it having a visible sign of your su of your being subject to, or submissive to your own husband, as Paul addresses in Ephesians 5, starting at verse 23. And so <laughs> the same people who might get worked up about the length of my hair probably don't get too worked up about the idea or are maybe worked up when you say, are you submissive to your husband? And of course, they don't understand what submissive there means in the context of the passage. Uh, verse 22 of that very same passage where it says, wives be sub uh, subject or submissive to your husbands. We're told that we're supposed to be submissive one to another in the church. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Then what does sub, uh, submissive mean? It means you let, you let those people be who God has made them to be. It's not for you to govern them. Everybody has their own role and responsibility in the church. And so it carries over into the marriage. And the husband is not the dictator. Read the rest of the passage. Read the close of the passage where Paul says, let me sum this up if I can. Let the wives respect their husbands and let the husbands love the wives. Okay, well, that helps you understand what he means at the beginning of the passage. But a man is not there to order his wife around because if he is, and if he's doing that, he's way out of bounds as far as what he's supposed to do. He's abusing his position. So that's not what it means. And people need to get over that, which again, here, if we're not reading into the text, but we're reading out of the text, we'll get a better understanding of what's being said here. So the main mm -hmm. context is the idea of covering and what do people see and perceive within the church. In a culture, clearly in, in Corinth, a bigger, a bigger deal where the men were trying to look like women and sounds very much culturally today because we see men going out of their way to look feminine 
and to the point where they make a living at it. And I, I wonder how much that may very well have been present. We don't know other than from third party people that will tell us about what life was like in Corinth. But the big point is, what do men look like? What do women look like? What's proper decorum within the church? And there is the, the idea of the covering of the head. So as we read on a little bit further, we see um, in verse um, 10, uh, for this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority over her head uh, because of the angels or like when you're in and the angels mean that the angels that are in the assembly of the church. It's so that there is not an offense in what is the formality of the church. There shouldn't be something where you have open rebellion among the people in the church setting. This is what he's getting at. So in verse 11, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman nor woman independent of man. This is not a matter of one being greater than the other. But if it's in the marriage context, there is an order that God has put in place. Does it make one inferior or one superior? Again, when, I, when I'm doing premarital counseling, I look back to what was the original Genesis when God says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother. It's actually Moses that's saying this, and the two will become one flesh. But when God says, it's not good that man would live alone, I will make a, a helper who is comparable to him not subject to him, not subservient, not as somebody who is supposed to be inferior in any way. This is a helpmate. And that's what God put together in the first place. That's what was intended originally. Man corrupts that. And that's just that's just a, a simple statement. We see it in the modern cultures today, within Islam, within some, you know, uh, South American and all the rest of it, women are seen as second class types of citizens. It's not right. God's design, but that's what cultures do. And it's been mm -hmm. that way for as long as anybody can know. Verse 12, for as a woman came from a man, even so also man came through the woman, but all things are from God. So it's like putting them in their place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a woman should wear a, a, a covering in Corinth so as not to be uh, misunderstood as not having a marital relationship kind of thing. But this is a way of putting the guys in their place. Mm -hmm. That's what's being said here. So it goes on, verse 13, judge among yourselves if it is proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered. So that means that she just goes before the Lord and I don't go with any sanction or with any kind of covering from my husband. She's doing this in a way of being defiant in that culture. That's the issue. So he's dealing with what is proper decorum within the church. Mm -hmm. And so he goes on and he says, now, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? So again, what constitutes long hair? Where is that? Uh, do I have a measurement? So I want to make sure I'm not infringing on what would have been cultural to Corinth. But he doesn't say it to Galatia, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica, any of those other places. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have it in any of his public addresses in, in the book of Acts that we know of. So there's something different about what's happening in Corinth that seems to be, it's an issue that he's going to address, but it doesn't seem to be an issue elsewhere in the world, but that would have been the culture everywhere else too. It must just be an issue within the church that he's addressing. Right. So because notice he, he comes right back to it in verse 15. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her as a covering. So he circles right back to the idea of covering here. Mm -hmm. So again, the idea of, is it is it trying to mix the idea that a man is trying to present himself as a woman? Because then at that point, yeah, then you're really kind of, you're, you're crossing lines that are not supposed to be crossed culturally anyway. So mm -hmm. again, do I, do I wear it at this length or even if it gets a little bit longer because I'm trying to look like a woman? Give it a rest. Look at me. <laughs> am, I, am I really kind of presenting myself as a woman? You're being ridiculous at that point. So I've had a person say that. Why do you go out of your way to look like a woman? Okay. If I look like a woman to that guy, I don't know what to tell him. Maybe an optometrist might be helpful. But I also asked him, do you make your wife cover her head when she prays? Because mm. context. And if we're going to be honest about it, Okay, but look at the last part that he says in verse 16. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we, the apostles, Paul speaking on behalf of them, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. This is just Paul saying, look, in the place where you guys live, and especially within the church, why have something that could potentially be contentious if wives are, are usurping 
the the authority, if you will, or their place within the marriage to give the impression of not having a covering, or in this case, not my husband's not my head. Mm -hmm. If that's happening openly in the church, Paul says, you probably not want to do that. If you have guys that are going out of their way to look feminine to the point where they're indistinguishable from their wives, you know, maybe not from the back, but from every conceivable way, that will become an issue. But even at that, right. if you guys are going to get into a big argument about it, there's no there's no such custom. It's just, again, it seems to be something much more prevalent. It has to be something much more prevalent in Corinth because it's the only place that he addresses it in all of his writings. It's the mm -hmm. only place. And at the end of it, he says, but we don't have any any type of a doctrinal you know, type of a thing where you, you must do this. It's not a thus says the Lord kind of a matter. It's a matter of decorum. And it seems to be very much more prominent and an issue at Corinth where it's not even dealt with anywhere else. Wow. So helpful. Thank you so much for explaining. Thank you for the, uh, the beginning, the most important part of how to look at the scriptures, how to read the text. It's so pivotal, it's so pivotal. So I uh, just appreciate your time and uh, I think your hair looks great. And uh, <laughs> I'm sporting my tattoo. No, I'm not, I'm only kidding guys. I just, you have to laugh, come on now. We have to have a, we have to have a laugh, right? And anyway, folks, check out Pastor Chris Quintana, Google his name and uh, Check out, I'll link the description uh, in the description box, our video about The Chosen. Check that out. That was a great conversation as well, delivered with truth and grace and love. And that's the way we should be handling these topics and just having these conversations. There's no need to attack people and all this sort of thing. It gets so crazy out there, Pastor Chris. It does. Well, in any event, um, I hope to see you again the next video, guys, if you like the content, please like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you'll know when a new video comes out. And I just uh, always encourage you to share the gospel and your testimony because that person, well, you have nothing to lose, but that person has everything to gain. So God bless you. I love you. And I'm praying for you all daily. Until next time, God bless you. Thank you.